language to express same or shared experience that I think sometimes our language is the problem. I know coming into a local church that had wrestled with the nature of its sort of previous almost Baptist Pentecostalism was with language. I came in using language in certain ways and some people were using language in other ways. And that's sometimes when the, the tension comes. But that sense that actually, if we're saying that almost that kind of pendulum or that spectrum as it swings almost, you know, what, what is orthodox theology or what is something which we should have? I want to say that charismatic theology is theology which is simply the fullness of the experience of God's uh, us being born of the Holy Spirit through God's good grace um, so I think sometimes when we then start to kind of give categories but we need categories in order to understand our experience and how we articulate that and, and perhaps different experiences but I struggle with sometimes you know the camps that we fall into so I think that's that question of what it looks like in a, a local setting I think that the labels that we use um, you know, can be problematic. Don't know if that's an answer to your question, Mark. Well, just 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 develop that idea. I mean, I mean, I, I think it's fair to say. Uh, my observation would be that uh, charismatics, charismatic people, charismatic theologians, uh, we're sort of synonymous with encountering and experiencing God. But is it a fair criticism to say we're a little bit lightweight when it comes to? theology and thinking and learning is that I mean is that a fair criticism Rob? Um, I think so it's something I've always struggled with personally because my background is very conservative in terms of theology um, it's kind of more formal that way I went, went to Roman Catholic school run by French monks uh, for wow. 15 years. You're covering your and bases there my friend. I'm covering all my bases I've, I've trained in kind of Ignatian direction you know in formation all Love those kind of things and and yeah, and actually, you know, I wonder sometimes that you're yeah, charismatic because I think the pen, I like, for me, I like the pendulum image. And I think we were swinging from a faith that was simply about knowledge and almost like the Catholic idea that you're saved by the church rather than experience actually of, of knowing God uh, yourself. And, and we swung the other way towards, gosh, we can experience God. And I think sometimes we, I mean, this might seem a very crude observation, but we're, sometimes very quick uh, to name certain things as a manifestation of the work of the Holy Spirit or to put our name behind things or to agree with things that actually um, can be quite problematic um, sometimes. And I, and, I, and I think that that's something I've always been quite wary of. But on the other hand, I believe in God who is, I'm made in his, his image, but he's not like me. He's supernatural. So I don't want a faith that tries to make him like me. So I've discovered within apophatic theology actually my kind of phd stuff and a lot was apathetic the fact that we god is beyond our understanding in a way that reaches a point and i think in charismatic theology we're trying to grasp something of the reality of god as manifest through the spirit within us but i, th I think it is an issue um of of kind of that we can be quite light experience trumps theology people when i came to the church they said to me well you're a theologian and it was um it was a criticism um, rather than somebody who would actually we want to think through the practical things. <laughs> when, when I when I um, came to my present church, um, somebody said to me, "You are a charismatic," and the look in their eyes was a, a, a look. It wasn't a compliment, I don't think, from that particular person. I think they they meant. Does that mean you're going to take the church in a slightly wacky? wacky direction so Lucy I mean th th this criticism that charismatics are a little bit lightweight in their thinking a bit wacky H how do we is that fair how do we counter that oh it's definitely fair um and I think the only way really to counter it is for us to be committed to theological education and um and depth and I, you know and it is why i do what i do really but yeah. even when i started my phd um in 2006 so not that long ago um there were people who said to me oh are you sure you want to do a phd you know do, what about your faith and i was like <laughs> seriously what you know so so it was still <laughs> rumbling i think that but it i mean there were root, the roots of the suspicion of academic theology 
were, were f well founded a number of years ago, you know, where the university perhaps wasn't the best place for a committed Christian to go and study yeah. their faith. There were better ways of studying the faith somewhere else. But I don't think that, first of all, that's not true today. Um, and secondly, there's a wealth of wonderful historical and systematic and biblical theology and biblical studies uh, now done at university. And also um, there are a number, I mean, there are just so many wonderful Christian scholars who are now writing on the scriptures and theology to engage with. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a bygone, you know, myth really. Well, it wasn't a myth. It's a, it's something of a past era and we're in a new era and it's time now for committed Christians to study their faith. And, and the, it, more than any other time in history, this has been available for anyone really. Um, and it's really exciting, you know, and Rob and I are both in theological education and it's just wonderful to see Christians discovering the riches and the depth and the history of their faith and, and the complexities of the scriptures, you know. Um, so I think it's, it is a, we've still got a long way to go, a long way to go in the charismatic church. Yeah. There are lots, many, many more Pentecostal theologians um, at doctorate level than there are charismatics, but um, but the tide's turning, and I'm you know I'm confident. I'm kind of optimistic that things will change, and that and what I see, and I'm sure Rob would say exactly the same, is that people are hungry. They are actually hungry for more um, than is perhaps being has been served up to them up until now. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm going to ask another question, but I just want to say to, to all of you, because um, I know some of you will have questions. And I think it would be great if, please, can you give your questions or any questions that you've got in the chat box for the time being? And uh, we'll come to them, because uh, we've got quite a lot of people on screen, otherwise I just open it up for Q&A. Uh, but if you can use the chat box, that would be great. Um, and uh, while you're thinking of the questions that you want to ask, um, maybe practical questions. I've got a practical question I want to ask you both, and it's about the use of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the life of the local church, which for any of us who've been trying to oversee, develop, nurture that within the life of the church, is um, it, 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 it's, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, trying to take a church through what we, we might use that word renewal. Um, have, have you guys got any insights or thoughts on how, practically speaking, in the life of a local church to encourage um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit into, in, in your local church? Either of you, please have a go at that one. You want... Shall I go? Yeah, Lucy. Yeah, yeah go for it. For me to go. Um, yeah. Yeah. I. I. Well. So, I married Nick in 1990, and he had been in. He He's seven years older than me, and he had um, was filled with the Spirit when he was 18, and um, then by then he was 32, and um, and I had very recently made a commitment to Christ and had a, a an experience where people laid hands on me and prayed for me and nothing particularly major happened at that time but my whole life changed completely completely changed and I came into a really living relationship with God that I had not had before at all and um, and came into the charismatic church because I got the gift of tongues and I started feeling like I could just literally chat to God, just, you know, that he was alive, real, that he spoke, he spoke through the scriptures, he spoke to me about things. So, <clears throat> so I, I came into a charismatic faith from a lovely Christian family that were very sort of normal Anglicans 
and I had not had didn't and I'd gone away from wanting to be a Christian didn't like evangelicals so it was a big shift for me and what I so so then I was quickly in church leadership married to a vicar not my life plan at all but I but what I understood and Nick and I shared was this feeling like God was really alive and that he was active and that he speaks and that he heals people and that he breaks in in surprising ways and that and I thought oh my gosh if I'd known the Christian life was like this I'd have signed up for this a while ago you know but um but so both of us for all our married lives and our ministries have encouraged people to seek more of the spirit so that's what we would do so that's what I would say is the first of all I would say create a really safe space for people to explore what it means to um, exercise spiritual gifts without causing mayhem or hurting people you know Paul says follow the way of love follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts especially that you may prophesy so you've got to have this really really loving safe environment that's what I think and the older I've got the more I th important I think that is yeah so that people don't Definitely. get hurt and then once you've got all your protocol and this is how we do it and this is how we then really encourage people to learn to exercise spiritual gifts and to grow in it to seek in it seek it pray for it practice on each other um and just i i think you know that life in the spirit can be enormously exciting it can also i mean there are a lot like you were saying i mean one of nick's favorite phrases is the charismatic church is a mixture of the powerful and the potty you know and i mean there are a lot of nutters in the charismatic world and you have to sift through you do and Paul said yeah. you know weigh and test absolutely everything if we stop doing that then we're going to be in trouble and we've already seen you I know mean, I've seen it loads you guys have seen it we're yeah. watching yeah. across the pond you know we know so we've got to be very yeah. careful and very loving and very scriptural but it, we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater because it's a wonderful gift. You know, these gifts are, are wonderful from God. So we can use them. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, Rob, I mean, you're a Baptist pastor like yeah. I am. Um, we, we, we want to encourage people to use the give, gifts that they've got. If, I don't know, you're in a church where you want him to see more of the development of the gifts of the Holy Spirit we 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 we, we use the we talk about the priesthood of all believers that everybody has got gifts that you know can be used for the good of the whole just practically yeah. as a pastor how how do you create the environment for that to happen yeah great question I think um on various levels. First off, we seek to model it within our corporate worship. And I'm not saying that always goes well, or that you would come to a service at ours and it would necessarily look that charismatic to use that kind of label, but seeking to model that, you know, so personally I would speak about the prophetic in my own life, would seek to be prophetic as God leads within uh, my prayers. Also, you know, in terms of encouraging when perhaps we have a baptism, very simple things, encouraging people to, to share words or to share scripture and pictures and just making it, I think, normifying it as part of the worshiping life of the church and recognizing that sometimes the issue within um, our gatherings is depending on the size of the gathering, obviously uh, standing up and even if you shared something with the leadership uh, prior, is very difficult. So we, you know, we're anything from 150 to 200 strong on a Sunday when we gather. That, you know, is an environment where it's tricky, perhaps you have to take a big deep breath. So obviously in terms of small groups as well, uh, the fellowship groups that meet during the week uh, would encourage people. So that's a really good place to try out the gifts, to, to pray for people and to say, look, I see a red bus and I have no idea what that means. Um, and, and also in terms of um, you know, healing, 
praying for healing in this big area because I go back to what was said before about, you know, the supernatural. God is the supernatural. God. I don't want to stand in the way of what God's doing. Uh, but I've seen people healed and I still don't believe it sometimes, but I saw it happen. Like I can't rationally say, why did that person's leg grow? Um, but it did. Uh, so there we go. <laughs> and so creating an environment where, where it's safe. And, but I think the question is how, you know, how, we, how we do that and how we do that in good order um, is a question. We lost Mark. Well, I, I, I think we'll probably come back. There may be more questions on this because I, I think we're all aware of some of the challenges of that. Um, I just, I just want to pick up on some of the questions in the chat box that um, um, Martin and Andrew and Neil have asked a question about. Um, what are the differences between charismatic theology and pastoral theology? That's a good question because I. I I mean, I'm always at pains to say to people, my theology is charismatic, not Pentecostal, but um, I would rather hear what you've got to say about that rather than me. So Lucy, what's the difference between somebody who, who's a Pentecostal in their theological thinking and somebody who's charismatic? Yeah, so I, I said something, didn't I, about Pente there being many more Pentecostal theologians than there are charismatic theologians. So I would say, just yeah. as a first off, those are people from Pentecostal denominations who are studying their theology within some kind of Pentecostal framework. So people like Amos Young, Frank McKeer, Chris Green, um, I'm sure there are others that I could think of. But so, um, but I, but classically, um, the, the, the difference has been in terms of the Pentecostal, well, Gordon Fee, Pentecostal biblical scholar, um, talking about the emphasis is more on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the, I know this is a bit of yeah. a caricature, but, but historically it was more about the baptism of the Holy Spirit that led to speaking in tongues was the kind of marker of Pentecostalism. Um, and charismatics was a later, it was a later move of the spirit, but also cross-denominational. So I would think of Pentecostalism it, with a big P as being a denominational movement um, and charismatics as being interdenominational. And so just being tied to one another through a well like at where I started with this shared view of being filled with the spirit which is a slightly it's a sort of nuance of how we understand the work of the spirit so that would be a very brief oh we've lost mark anyway we can carry on yeah. Presumably he'll we'll come back. but I I don't know I mean that's just a sort of skating over the surface what do you want to add to that Rob yeah I don't know what you would say in terms of because personally I yeah don't hold to in a sense, a second baptism in the spirit per se. Mm -hmm. So I would say if you are a Christian and you can name Jesus Christ as Lord, then you have the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I would then perhaps want to talk about being aware of the Holy Spirit working within you. And, and maybe that's what some, what Pentecost denomination and others might say, well, that's the baptism of the spirit. But I don't want then to deny what God does at that point of conversion, which is perhaps with my more, more reformed roots is the greatest miracle of them all. I don't know what you think on, the whole kind of yeah and I think that there's it. room in charismatic circles for that kind of view I don't yeah. think I think I think maybe early on in the 60s I think people were kind of like oh have you got the gift of tongues that means you're charismatic but I think quite quickly charismatics moved away from that it seems I don't really I mean I don't I don't know a lot about that but I got the impression yeah. that by the 70s and 80s people were saying oh or say 80s there's no second class um, Christians and yeah. etc so yeah. um but there, there's definitely a difference between charismatic and Pentecostal perspectives I would say um but yeah. it's a shifting it's a shifting landscape and Pentecostalism is very broad now um and and has a longer history so it's over 100 years now uh, and it hugely hugely fast growing church in globally um and many many denominations yeah and almost i suppose the pentecostal reflection is almost denominational in a way isn't it in terms of the same way i would talk about a, a confessional baptist theology or an anglican confessional theology of reflecting on what that means within our our uh setup but, exactly. um, but exactly. i think 
Yeah. And I think interesting in the 90s as well, because I think a lot of the move towards um, the kind of worship movement as we have, which was alongside the nature of mm -hmm. the um, the Toronto blessing, but that mm -hmm. kind of happy, I used to have a t-shirt that said happy clappy on the front. It was almost that if you were happy clappy, mm -hmm. then you were charismatic. And mm -hmm. and that's not the same. There's a, there's a great book, um, I, I think it's good, by Mark Tanner from a few years ago from the New Wine Movement called mm -hmm. about the introvert charismatic. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, I, I know when we went to we went to New Wine with about forty people from my church, and uh, they had a seminar on um, you know, introvert charismatic life, and like my whole group went. <laughs> um, and no, no, uh, I think my husband would be that would say the same. You know, he's a, he's really just loves the Bible and loves studying the scriptures, yeah. and is a, is quite an introverted person. Um, but yeah. So, so on that, you mentioned Mark's name, Mark Tanner. So people were saying um, a good role model and people, and I yeah. would say Andrew Lord um, yeah. has written Charismatic Theology. I've written some Charismatic Theology. Mark Tanner, um, who else would you say, Rob, um, to, um, to refer people to? I think, I mean, within, I mean, within the new why movement, within, within the prophetic, Bruce, Bruce, or Ponsonby, yeah, Simon yeah. Ponsonby, and Bruce Collins might not be known as to many, but on a more, not published quite so widely, but on the more prophetic side of things, but Simon Ponsonby, definitely. Yeah, so there's lots of popular books yeah. who aren't scholars, but in terms of scholars, I would say yeah. um, those would be the names I would think of. And and I think that's the big issue, just going back to, not to drag it back before, but the whole the whole anti-intellectualism anti that we talked about, I think it's just to encourage people that there is a deep well of faith and it's it's okay to dive in and it's it's okay to find stuff hard and mm. to know that our faith is simple, but it is deep. And I, and I just think it's it's about resisting that that sense of, well, I just I just feel it and I just know it. Mm. Um, and, and it's just about actually kind of, yeah, living that, but also wanting to dig deep into the scriptures in the midst of it and, and not and not succumbing, I think back to the extrovert, introvert, that, you know, a noisy church, in a sense, with lots of uh, manifestations is anyway more charismatic than a church that might be, um, actually look a lot quieter, but people are, are quietly hearing from God in a sense. I think yeah. sometimes we've been very broad brush, yeah. And praying for each other really powerfully, you know people praying for one another and and seeing people healed and mm. like but not necessarily with lots of shouting or anything like that but yeah so but that's the nice thing i think about where we are where mm. we've got to with the work of the spirit and yeah absolutely is, but i do think there's a lot more freedom to be for people to be able to express it in line with their own personalities yeah and um, although it's still a bit monochrome in i mean definitely some worship needs a bit of a yeah, it does. <laughs> We're all feeling that, aren't we? I think so. Um... Hey? I was going to say, uh, uh, just try and move on and bring one of the questions in, if I may. Um, Susanna, um, if you could unmute yourself um, and uh, just, you put a question in, but I wonder whether you may mute yourself and ask your question. That would be, that'd be great. Yeah, okay, so uh, hoping you can hear me because I had problems with my microphone yesterday. We can hear you. Yeah. Um, this morning, Bev Murrell um, was talking about how uh, revelation can become systematized. Um, it becomes method and then it becomes, um, this is the way we do things and it becomes constitution. And then without knowing it, you become more concerned about the, the how we're doing it than the why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, I, I mean, I have no opinion on this, but it just sort of struck me that given that charismaticism is about experiencing revelation by the Holy Spirit in whatever way that may be, uh, through gifts or through um, hearing from God, mm. uh, uh, just kind of how do we watch that in the study of theology that doesn't become systematization mm. that drifts away from the, um, from the revelation? Yeah, okay. Lucy, do you want to have a go at that? Do you want me to have a go at that? Um, I suppose. I suppose I feel like that's isn't that's a perennial problem for the church. I mean that that's that's not just charismatics, is it? That's and and 
um, many denominations are, well, all denominations are in danger of, of that. And yes, it's a good observation. So how do we become a church that is um, always reforming? Um, and I, I suppose I, um, I think that there's an awful lot of moving parts that need to go into that. And one is, is a commitment to listening to the scriptures and the spirit. So, you know, li listening to the Bible and letting it say the hard things that it says to us and, and a posture of humility and learning. You know, if we, if we think that we've pinned everything down and got all the answers, then we won't listen to whether there may be new answers that we're not listening to. Um, and I think that we, to be a reforming church, we have to be enormously secure in our relationship with God and who we are, because the reason people won't change or won't move when the spirit's trying to move them is because their identities have got stuck in something, you know, and it's too threatening to become something else. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. I, the, the older I get, the more I feel like we, we need to think about how we become healed and whole people, you know, secure people who are not um, prey to our own insecurities and, and needs and distorted desires and, you know, all those things, because I think those are the things that... Yeah that push us off the rails or, or sort of keep us from flourishing and changing and blossoming. Um, so sorry, that's a bit of a long winded answer, but that, you know, I think it's just multifaceted um, and it's as much to do with our inner lives as Christians, as it is to mm. what the institution looks like, who's running it, how they go about the process of listening to the spirit, etc. Okay, thank you. Um, Rob, I'm going to take you to an, another question that um, has come to us. Good question uh, from Aaron. Aaron, I tell you what, rather than me asking the question, you just don't yourself and ask the question. Yeah. I think you're asking me to ask my question. Is that right? Yeah. Sounds like it. Okay, uh, I'll just read it out. Our descriptions of the charismatic and especially the gifts of the spirit tend to focus on how this is expressed in church gatherings. Keen to hear how you can equip people for charismatic everyday discipleship um, lifestyle. So I guess getting beyond how this is expressed when we gather, but how do we equip people to live lives that are supernatural um, that express the gifts of the spirit, especially? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, if I come in, I think that's a great question, because actually I find the talk of the, the gathering actually more, more difficult to answer. And we do, you're right, and we do put the focus on that. But I find it actually easier in a way to talk about what it means to live that spirit filled life, because I, I think it's if we talk about the practicing of the gifts, particularly the, the prophetic, um, you know, wherever we are, um, if we're seeking to be disciples, that's where I said a thing about the wine that, you know, I'm in a sense, I'm a charismatic Christian, but I'm a Christian and I'm seeking to live my life uh, for the Lord and to listen to his leading. So you know, wherever I am and wherever we are, we should be encouraging people as believers and ourselves to ask the question of how is God speaking to me in this? Um, you know, how is the Holy Spirit leading me? Um, you know, and, and I think encouraging people and that actually Mark, not to preempt one of Mark's uh, grenades he might throw into the discussion, but the question about, you know, is now the talk's all, all, all about mission and, uh, and I, you know, I'm engaged with an agency like College all about pioneering and evangelism, but actually the heart of that is, is, is moving with the spirit in terms of what we're doing. So there is no distinction for me. Yeah. Um, and, and I would just say it's really free. And I would or even just encourage people saying, because as a church leader, you know, some people annoy me. I don't want to tell people that, let you into a secret. Um, but I can sometimes get a bit, <laughs> a, bit, um, a bit sensitive. Someone comes into church and is really angry and annoying. I should actually be more worried about if they're this angry and annoying in church, they're probably this angry and annoying at work or 
somewhere else and and so actually it's how we recognize wherever we go the spirit it should be transforming us so then we transform the atmosphere of wherever we go i mean that's a point that's been made elsewhere um and I, so i think yeah it's a great question because i think we worry about when i came to my church they worried about it not looking noisy enough or charismatic enough whereas we were interested in, in the disciple discipled life um yeah you, do you, aaron do you want to come back on that one as somebody, Aaron, I, I, I declare a slight vested interest here, but he planted a church that's what, three years old? Uh, five, uh, 2016, so yeah, in our fifth year now. So, so let me ask a spot then. How, how, I mean, I know you're a charismatic theologian. How, how, how does it work for you, particularly in a pioneering situation with like uh, young, young Christians, people new to faith? People with no church background at all. It's not the rules of this game, Dad. You can't ask me questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, what does it look like? Yeah, I mean, I think there's. I, I guess I. I think it's. Um, so there's something in me that wants that wants the level of um, control, <laughs> you know, and, and wants things to be neat and orderly, and wants. Um, and I guess you know. For me, I'd rather have us err on the side of um, having a go, but getting it wrong sometimes than, than in, safe, in safety or control, not having a go. So I guess that's my fear. I guess I'd rather err on the side of, of faith that God could heal the person I'm going to pray for than not take the risk to pray for the person. So, yeah, I think that's, I mean, I guess that's that and that expectation, that culture is one that we're trying to develop. And I think in some ways you leverage the gathering for the scattering, so to speak. So you use the spaces when you're together to teach people, to train people, to equip people so that it becomes normal that they pray for the colleague at work or they, you know, the kid in the playground um, yeah. you know, is, is actually wondering what's God got to say to my friends today or I guess that's the kind of, I guess that's what we're going for. But yeah, I, I guess I asked the question because also I'm interested in what does that really look like to create a culture of um, of that stuff where it's it, the default setting is we move in that way and we expect that we, and I certainly know we're not there yet, but in terms of pioneering, um, I guess, yeah, one final reflection is that the, the, for me, the, the, the exciting thing about pairing together charismatic theology with pioneering mission is that you can see breakthrough in a moment that would otherwise potentially take years or, or never happen and so actually you know to see one person's life miraculously transformed can really open a door to a whole community in a way that um faithful presence with those people could take years to develop um and so i think there's something in that as well of um of, of it being a serious weapon as we think about engaging communities and yeah, pioneering mission. I think that um, that's great, Aaron. I think that's brilliant um, because I think that's exactly what Nick and I would say uh, about 16 years of, well, 30 years of ministry, but 16 years of, of sort of moving out of um, structures. But because for, for me, and it goes back to what Rob, was saying as well is that I think it's all rooted in the prophetic and I think this is why the charismatics th this is a distinctive of um and Rob said it and Aaron said it it's like you you expect you have this expectation that God might tell you what to do or might give you some instruction or might show you something and it might you know that I think is, um, and you know you might be wrong, like you just know you might be wrong, but you have a go. And as you work, move out in that sort of experimentation of, I think I've heard something, I think I'm gonna act on it, that you, you can be taken into situations or you can see things or you can, something can be catalyzed in a way that you could not have planned for, however strategic or you know careful you were, or however wise your counsellors were, you could not have planned for that event. And then God has clearly led you into it, and then broken some broken into it, and everything's changed. And I and I 
think that that is what I think is the most exciting thing about being charismatic is that God speaks and and you know you can get it wrong but when you don't get it wrong it's amazing just going on to some more questions um Ruth Ruth Moriarty um it would be great Ruth if you be uh, asking a question about the pandemic um just if you could unmute yourself Ruth and just ask that question that'd be great um, so I'm curious about how the pandemic has affected charismatic thoughts about the value of sung worship and particularly of gathered sung worship. Yeah, Rob. Yeah, thank you. It's a great it's a great question, isn't it? It does make us reflect upon the nature of how we worship and what we define as worship and obviously in a sense liturgical theology is is a is is something in itself and but i think i mean there's a book from a good number of years ago practical theologian pete ward wrote a book years ago called selling worship talked about you know the nature of the worship movement especially as industry and consumer industry especially in the states um also in the uk and that's not pulling it down at all but obviously so much of the charismatic renewal was linked in obviously to almost worship leader as priest and and i think I, I think it's just helpful for us to see worship as the whole uh, life of the church and in our gatherings. I mean, this might seem, sound like a pat answer, but I think it's forced us, hasn't it, to consider what does it look like and not simply to reflect to music or have someone sing over us. What does it actually mean for us to worship and to use scripture and the Psalms? And when I came to my church 13 years ago, um, there were issues within the worship team and the church had been, would have named itself as very Pentecostal. And what we did for three months was we asked, um, we didn't sing at all. Um, I asked the entire wow. worship, I asked all the worship leaders to step down um, because it was becoming pride was becoming, it's easy. It sounds really of me going, oh, it's pride. But there was a lot of stuff going on. The church had been through three church splits and yeah. um, it was just like, okay, um, we've got to kind of say, what does it mean for us to hear from God and hear from God's word? Um, and I just think we need to be open, don't we? I don't know, if Ruth, if that's, an answer really at all i think just the worship leader as priest you know is interesting because in a baptist setting we talk about um priests of all believers but actually we're, we're cautious about the word priest for leaders but i think there is a priestly authority for baptist ministers even um but but i office of priest but the worship leader actually took that role that, that that person leads us into the presence of god and if worship hasn't gone well today for me then i haven't met with god and i find that very problematic um, yeah, I think that's a helpful anal um, analogy about priest and, and worship leader, without doubt. Um, I guess my, my thought was more about, um, no. I think I'm sensing a pain okay. of not being able to sing that's, together. That's a, yeah. And I wondered what yeah. that, okay. how that will affect the church long term. No, that's a good, yeah. That's a good I, question. And just not, yeah. not to hog it, not to hog it. I'll just be brief, very brief and just say, actually, yeah, when we, you know, it's well in the minister, we always lead us, don't we have these great, oh, we did this. And, but when we didn't, when we didn't sing, there was a real grief in the church um, all those 12, 13 years ago. Um, and there is a real grief now. Um, yeah, I'd name that. Absolutely. I don't, Lucy, if you. Yeah, I, uh, no, I know. I, I, I um, concur with that, that not say, I love singing i i i've had problems with charismatic sung worship for a while because um i think i well we had a wonderful worship leader in zimbabwe absolutely wonderful and wonderful worship teams um and it was always it felt like it was always sort of well, it was always surprising, you know, you would come in and you weren't quite sure where you were going to be led in which song and because we were singing in two different languages and it was just lovely. And I, and then when we came back here, I felt it was just so often so samey and I and I thought I don't really get that like if if the spirits leading us surely we will have some, you know, we should have more diversity in our singing. So that I just that's for me that's a real I would love to see that. Um, I just wanted to mention Nick Drake. I don't know if anyone, uh, because he is a worship, he's, he's an academic who has written about worship. So um, that might be worth following up if people have an interest in that. Um, but I think that, I think we'll go back to singing. I mean, when we can, we will go back to singing because singing is part of what 
God's people do to praise him and mm -hmm. you know and worship and it's something it's a yeah it's a wonderful thing to do in a group and and in a community so we will go back to it but it it's and it's not easy to do it on we can't do it on zoom in the same way and there are some of us picking up on that issue of singing um can, can we just stick with the pandemic for a minute um while while we're on that subject um is, i've done quite a lot of thinking a bit of writing um and being a charismatic thinker and seeing people who we love die and seeing lots of suffering and not an easy fit um in fact i'm not sure here's my question that my my as a charismatic theologian it is sufficiently adequate and robust to help me through a season as a local church pastor of um like the one we're going through at the moment and i wonder because we, we we have had a tendency to be or we handle that in the best way um so we're not really sure or a little bit uncertain about what to do during times like a pandemic mm -hmm. and i just wonder i'm not quite sure if there's any solutions or answers but maybe just some reflections on how we navigate our way through the pandemic um with a degree of humility and honesty at the moment yeah and rob do you want to have a go at that yeah um thank you i mean for me, there, there's a great book by John Swinton, again from a few years ago, called Raging with Compassion, which is a pastoral response to the, the problem of evil. And perhaps you might all be familiar with this idea of suffering with the nature of the problem of evil. And what he argues is that sometimes, you know, our solutions to the problem of evil, sometimes the things we want to say about why this thing happened to this person, actually, they are inherently often evil within themselves because they, they are pastorally not uh, satisfying. They might be even theologically or theoretically satisfying, but they don't actually deal uh, with the problem. And he points to Stanley Hauervas, an American ethicist, and yeah. who, who talks about the idea that, you know, that the early church, it seems, didn't really ask, you know, we want always to know why something happens, um, but they were more interested in that, how do we resist this evil together? And he used the expression, how do we become a theodic community? And so theodicy is this uh, study of the problem of evil, problem of suffering. So how do we become a community? And this, I think this is really, I, I find this really helpful because it moves us beyond me having to have an answer. I think we have to address that to some degree as well. But it means saying, how do we as a community, how are we resisting this, standing on the rock of our salvation? And how are we resisting this evil together? And then it takes us into justice issues as well. Um, so how are we supporting our communities? How are we uh, caring for the minorities as we resist this evil together? Rather than going down lots of rabbit holes and just very quick, just alongside that to say, some things are just evil and some things are just wrong. Sometimes there is not an explanation for why someone died, they just died. Um, and that's the nature of yeah. sin. Not, you might not, oh, my, my PhD was, about all about this in a way in terms of crisis yeah. moments yeah i, I and, and john swinton's book yeah, is sorry, go on, Lucy. Yeah. no i was just going to say I, that is a wonderful book raging with compassion and i would definitely recommend that as well and i think one of the things that has been coming out a lot in the last few months which actually one of my ex-colleagues taught on a lot is lament and how we have a, a theology of lament which is really an expression of hope you know that lamenting is so the charismatics historically have been bad at lamenting yeah. um and bringing pain to god and even admitting pain you know so pain is something that is supposed to be just whizzed through you know got rid of um and everybody yeah. knows that that you can't do that in life and anyway it's not healthy and so i think that I, I feel that this last year has just been full of a lot of loss and a lot of grief and i think that opening up spaces in our 
times of communal times of worship and prayer we've got to make space for that grief and and make a place for it i think the difficult thing for charismatics is this um is the kind of fundamental belief that god can change things and so when you're in a situation that either seems to go on and on and on and on without any change or you have prayed for change or, or healing or and and you, you, you know those prayers weren't answered that that's hard it's hard to occupy that space sometimes it's easier just to say well I don't believe it's going to happen you know and so I feel my heart goes out to um, thinking and feeling charismatics because I know that you live in tension you know we live with this kind of yeah. we don't want to lead people uh, we don't want to give them false hope and we don't but on the other hand we live with this kind of but these things happen they can happen good you know so it's a, it's a, a tense place to be but it's a better place to be i think um yeah. overall okay um paul paul farrow um has asked a question which is a i think an interesting one um paul uh, if you can unmute yourself and uh, ask your question about big characters and personalities. Yeah, um, I'm aware that within the whole Christian scene, there are a lot of cross-denominational teachers um, who are very influential and have followings across all of our congregations. And these people have their own particular um, uh, views, often quite contestable views, uh, and we also see a, a, a line of authoritarianism running through it as well. Uh, some of the people claiming particularly high levels of authority uh, to themselves. And so we, we see um, a whole lot of people who are being taught from outside of our communities um, with prophetic announcements from different places. Um, we'll probably see a little bit of an eruption in six days' time because of the number of Christians who are attached to prophecies concerning the presidency of the USA. And my, my question really is, how do we handle this cross-flow of authoritative teaching coming through our communities? Yeah, good question. Lucy, do you want to have first go at that one? Um, yeah, I think that's a brilliant question, and I think it's a really, really pertinent question for church leaders. Um, and I, I often thought about it myself, <laughs> and um, thought, what do we do? Because we can't, um, as church leaders. I, I mean, I remember one person. I did say, I did say to him, "You should not listen to Mark Driscoll." and um you know and i just said it and i was like i'm gonna say it and this was years and years ago you know when he was kind of like uh, anyway never mind uh, so but it's tricky it's a tricky thing to manage is what i'm saying um because you have to decide are you going to be equally as authoritarian to say do not listen to those people or are you going to so so first of all you have to do a bit of homework yourself so you do have to know who is out there and who people are listening to and whether you're going to endorse that person or whether you're going to say actually let's sit down and let's look at what they're teaching and let's you know so i mean my preferred option as a teacher is not to tell people not to listen to somebody, but to say, I'm glad to hear that. although I was driven at that point to say, please don't. But um, so I, so would be to sit down, you know, and, ed and, and do it through education and listening and, and questioning and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that is a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And if you're gonna try and keep your finger on the pulse of every single person who's out there teaching on the internet, um, that's gonna be a big call. So my favorite my favorite analogy is, um, is the one of how they teach bank tellers to tell a counterfeit from a real note, you know, and instead of showing them lots of counterfeit notes, they just immerse them in the real note. 
you know, just immerse the person in, in just give them one after another, after another real note to look at so that when something false comes along, they guess they, they're like, oh, I know that's not the real thing. So uh, I, that's my, I mean, that's, I think is our best tactic is just giving people enough good, solid, it's robust orthodox theology so that when they're listening to something that's a bit off they get it just following on rob from that um you, you probably know just like i do that um people that might listen to us on a sunday for instance some of them are listening to religious tv and and various other voices uh, and that's sort of obviously at one end of the spectrum, uh, some of which is helpful and some of which isn't so helpful. At the other end of the spectrum, we have this sort of aversion specifically in Baptist churches for, for the apostolic uh, mm -hmm. and for people who, who, who actually do have authority in, of a translocal sort. Um, and, and I just wondered whether you might have any reflections or observations on on how we, how do we navigate that sort of thing? There's yeah. sort of two questions there, really. Yeah, yeah, and I think, I mean, trust and relationships are key between a church and those who you seek to relate to in an apostolic way, or in terms of speakers you may bring into a setting, or books you rec you, you may recommend, or conferences, and and those kind of things to people. I think we are more, not to go back to the previous thread, but we are more resourced than ever and more connected than ever. And there was a great quote a few years ago by Barnabas Piper, the son of John Piper, a reformed teacher in the States, saying, it was interesting, you know, when I stopped listening to podcasts of lots of preachers, my own preacher uh, just got a lot better. Um, and it was that sense that, you know, it, there wasn't just one voice amongst all the others. And, but I think the problem is again of camps, isn't it? We're very keen to kind of say, you know, we're in this camp or this camp or that camp, and even to associate with different apostolic authority or this person's okay, but this person isn't. But on the other hand, I agree with Lucy that I think there are times when, you know, we're called in Ephesians, those people are not blown by every wind of doctrine. And, and so therefore people need to be equipped to, to engage properly with different voices and to be able to say, look, actually, I don't think this person is right or they're not right on this. Um, and I think we just have to be increasingly careful um, as church leaders with people that we point other people to. Um, and the question of authority, and I think going right back to the question of authority of scripture and, and our theology of scripture, I think we always, I mean, for me, doctrine of God and our understanding of scripture are key. And, and I think so we don't then succumb to the charismatic fault, I would say, of something more Gnostic. And by that, I mean, is that we've almost got a uh, uh, another, you know, you may say it like this, but God has told me yeah. um, and almost a Gnostic idea that almost a, a super spiritual authority that's come from elsewhere. And I think when Lucy and I would do the same talk about people, perhaps very much on the fringe of charismatic life, it, it's almost like, well, you know, they come and say, God's told me this. Well, God hasn't told me that. Um, but I think, yeah, we just need to, and I think, Mark, you're absolutely right. It's uh, it's exhausting to be on top of all the local, all the current things. I just had just one thing from yesterday, actually. John Mark Comer might be known to some people, American teacher, been at New Wine, written a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And uh, we, we've recommended it yeah. to a small group and then someone came up and said oh I've looked online and it turns out that he's a polytheist and and his church does this and church does that and you know and I can't you know I can't find much about that but it, it, it's it's a danger when we're trying to kind of understand the purity of what's being of what's being taught we just need to be as about what Lucy said we need to be uh, rooted within scripture recognizing that actually there are questions there too <laughs> I don't think John Mark Comer is a polytheist. I don't think he is, and I, <laughs> Just I couldn't, say, I couldn't I find think, it. Yeah. No, I think yeah. I think he's fine. He, um, yeah. Well, it is true. This is a this is a really good case in point, Rob, isn't it? Yeah, is I thought so. Thing, 
you you actually and this is what i'd just like to add just the final thing on this is that if you're listening to someone and you know nothing about their private life you really need to un you really need to remember that you actually don't know who they are at all you you don't the, and the thing about all our local churches is that the people who come to our churches know quite a lot about us don't they and and they they've probably seen a bit of warts and all and you know i know definitely when my kids were little you know shouting at my kids and all sorts of things and and the and and that's life and that's real life and it's good and it's right and the problem with these disembodied preachers is that you don't you don't know what they're like and i would be yeah i'm a great believer in in small community churches and learning together from and preachers being rooted in their communities and being listened to by the people who know them and who see the way they treat their husbands and their wives or their nephews or their nieces or the elderly in the church you know that's important it's really important yeah because because otherwise it's celebrity idolatry isn't it yeah. it's part of that big consumer move and i would say I don't know whether this would go down very well, but to say there's a reason why in the publishing world, why these big leaders of mega churches, I, I might sound really bitter, but there's a reason why they get publishing contracts is because they can sell more books. Yeah, um, no, I think, uh, you, I, no, I, you, you don't sound bitter, you sound <laughs> wise to me. It, no, but it's wise, Rob. The thing is, there's a, there's a consumer culture out there that has that has consumed the church in a lot of ways. And so the more we can resist that, I think the better will be. And we were talking about discipleship. We're talking about how, you know, what does whole life following Jesus look like? And um, it is just the every day, like every day getting up and saying, how can I be a Christian today? You know, how can I honor Jesus? And the people around us are the people who help us to do it. Yeah. So. Yeah, good point. Um, we're going to, we, we, we've just got five minutes left and it'd be good to pray. Um, and, and anyway, I'm a bit loath to draw our conversation to a close because it's, you know, I just found it so stimulating um, to, to engage around those issues and see where our conversation took us. Thank you for all those who asked questions. Um, I, I'd just like us just to spend a couple of moments praying. And I wonder, Rob and Lucy, I, I, I know a good number of the people on on these three screens, uh, not all of them, but but I guess in one way or another, we're working in local church leadership, and we all share a longing to see more of the work of the Spirit. Uh, and I wonder whether, if perhaps the two of you would would just pray um, for the for, for for local churches that we represent, most of them, but not exclusively within the Baptist world. If, you, if the two of you could lead us in prayer um, and then I'll pray for you two as well. That would be fantastic. If you could do that, that would be great. Thank you. Do you yeah. want to pray first, Rob, and then I'll... Yeah, I can pray. Yeah, yeah let's, uh, let's pray. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of gathering like this. And I thank you for the privilege of uh, meeting virtually at a distance all these different people and for all the different churches and ministries and lives and families represented. And I ask, Lord, that you would pour your spirit out afresh. Uh, Lord, that we would receive a fresh anointing. We would also receive um, a greater measure of faith as well to act in courage. And Lord, that you would continue to reveal yourself to each one here. And Lord, in the ups and downs of uh, ministry life and local church life, I pray you'd help us all to focus on what you are doing and who you are rather than sometimes the things that we don't think you're doing and what we think you're not. And we thank you, Lord, that the local church is beautiful. And I thank you, Lord, the church has been beautiful in this pandemic and will continue to be so. And I th thank you for tears shared and, and laughter given and compassion and mercy and just enable each to, as you pour your spirit out into them, that that mercy and compassion would flow out to, their, to themselves, to their families, uh, to their colleagues and, and beyond and Lord we want to for me that with a renewal of the church Lord we want to see it uh, yeah. come Lord uh, reveal yourself we 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 you are enough for us 
Jesus. You are enough for us. And, and you have done it on the cross. And just, I just pray, I just feel a sense of just very simply praying that God is any of us having to earn it. We don't have to earn anything. Yeah. Uh, the simple message of grace. Just save all of us. And everyone listen here from having to earn it or work or working hard at being a charismatic that if this needs to happen or these tongues or this for us to, to tick the box, uh, free us all, we pray, that we may experience your grace. Uh, come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the gift of yourself and the gift of your spirit and the gift of your scriptures and the gift of one another. Just thank you so much for um, the goodness of being part of communities that love you and worship you and, and really want to make a difference in the society around us. And I, I just, um, I know that the people here are, are people who really want to see um, your compassion and your love and your presence changing things around them and and we all want that lord so i pray that you would like rob prayed just anoint us and um gift us so that we can uh, make a difference to people around us by just bringing your presence into situations and i pray lord for all of us that we would know more of your love and more of um, how yeah. deeply loved we are by you and how precious we are and how valuable we are to you. And I pray that we would grow in hearing your voice, that you would give, give us um, just a kind of childlike understanding of what it means to be in relationship with you and to hear your voice and to step out and to just enjoy being in your presence praying listening to your word and so I pray Lord for this time um, that I love the name fresh streams and I I do pray um, that these days would be refreshing for the people here, that you would pour out the refreshing presence of your spirit and where we are really tired and really weary of so many things. Um, I pray that you would help us come to you and just receive um, the water of your spirit and new life to give us strength and energy to face all that we're facing in the next few weeks. In your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 And uh, for, for those of us on the screen, uh, you may just join me in, in raising your hands as we pray for Rob and Lucy. I thank you, Lord, for, um, for Rob and for Lucy. Thank you for all that they've shared, um, not just as thinkers, but as practitioners uh, this afternoon. Um, we, we don't just want to um, words on a Zoom conversation, but we uh, have a longing to see more of your spirit at work through the life of uh, ordinary people in this nation. Uh, and uh, I, I just pray, Rob, for you uh, in leadership and ministry uh, in Colwyn Bay. I just pray that God will continue to work through you and use you and that you will know the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, thank you, Lord, for Rob's uh, work as a church leader and for his um, work with uh, the Light Collective and Northern Baptist College and people coming through in training and ordination and we pray for your blessing on all of that. Thank you that he models somebody who wants to both encounter you and to think um, wisely about you uh, and I thank you Lord for Lucy uh, and I know it's been um, a, a challenging season um, for her and I just pray for healing and blessing and renewal and recovery um, thank you Lord um, we, we just I just got that verse from Psalm 23 in my mind uh, he restores my soul and I just pray that for you that you'll know a restoration of um, of your soul your inner world your inner life 
uh, and uh, that all the work that you do through WTC will know um, a real sense of a uh, momentum and impetus and blessing upon it. Thank you, Lord, for our time together this afternoon. It's been good to talk. It's been good to be together. It's not quite the same as being together in flesh. But, Lord, we thank you for this provision for us at this time. And uh, pray, Lord Jesus, that you'll continue the journey with us in these days ahead. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. A big thank you to Rob and Lucy. It's been, it's been great. Um, thanks so much uh, for joining us this afternoon. Oh, 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 oh,